have to do the dance. The dance. What's the dance? I don't know. <laughs> the dance I did was like this. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Wow, what a great intro. First of all, I think you should all applaud yourself by, by staying here and sticking around. I, my head's about to explode, but I am the last person to separate you through to alcohol. I'm like the conduit. So either it's going to go well or it's going to go really po poorly. But first, give yourselves a round of applause for showing up. Yeah. And also, let's just. I've learned a ton, and I'm a dinosaur. I've been around for a very long time. I'm still learning. It's really a gift to have the speakers that we had today drop so much knowledge on us. But let's really give a huge round of applause to Jared, UIE, 500 Startups, and all the conference organizers, because this is a shitload of work. And they don't really get much money or any money for this. So let's give them a huge round of applause. OK, that's better. I also want to thank Jared because he print, he's like one of the few people who has introduced me and pronounced my name right. <laughs> people actually come and they say, how do you pronounce your name? And I'm like, Judice, Judice, like Jewish geese, Judice. And, like, and, and I could see them practicing in a corner. And then they come and they introduce me and they completely fuck it up. So I'm just like really, I'm just really happy. So it's a win-win for me. So why am I here today? So today, I'm going to talk to you about this new kind of leader called the DEO. I'm going to discuss the qualities that separate them from traditional business leaders. And I'm going to provide you with some tools that I've developed over the years so you all could live the life of a DEO too. And um, introduce you to some of today's role models and rule breakers. Does that sound good? Does that sound worth 30 minutes? Yes? OK. So um, first of all, how many people recognize this image? Yeah. Where, how many people do? I just, I'm polling the audience for people who are like over, th over 30. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Yeah, it's good. All right. Yeah, this is, this is what, if, if you want to know what acquisition feels like, or if, you've ever gone, if your company has ever gone through an acquisition, this is kind of what it feels like. It's this moment when you kind of have to decide whether you're going to like give up or just go off the cliff and not really know what, what the outcome would be. I personally do not believe they died. So I think this is a good outcome. <laughs> so over the course of 15 years, I led a very successful interaction design studio um, called Hot Studio. And uh, it had grown um, over the 15 plus years. It grew from one to 100 people and two, in two locations, both in San Francisco and New York City. And um, a, little bit, a, little of, a little under two years ago, well, actually, probably two years ago, like this month, Facebook came calling um, and offered to uh, acquire the, the people of Hot Studio. So, I mean, it sounds, sounds like um, amazing, right? But when you, think, when you have to really think about this, why give up the power of being independent? And as my son would say, being the boss of all these people. <laughs> and like, why should I suddenly change careers and work at a place where the average the employees uh, are half my age, really? Seriously, half my age. <laughs> And um, plus, like judging from past experiences, um, most acquisitions of design studios go really badly. So would I want, why would I take that kind of chance? Why would I want that to be part of my legacy? If I was afraid of the uncertainty and risk in giving up a successful company, which really was my life's work, I would have I would have declined the offer and continued on being like the coolest company on the planet. But I did a couple of things. First thing is what Leah so eloquently uh, talked about today was I trusted my intuition. Um, the numbers worked, but this could have been suicide uh, and turned out to be a huge disaster if 
uh, the company cultures clashed and uh, the values weren't in alignment with each other. Um, we took this, this huge risk because um, in this acquisition, um, my, my employees, nobody knew that this was gonna happen. So they were like suddenly surprised one day when I came in and announced that they might be out of a job or they might be working at Facebook. So they could have all left following that announcement. Um, and it was a huge disruption of the status quo because suddenly, thankfully, interaction design studios are now in great demand. And we became very highly valued in the marketplace. As a matter of fact, Hot Studio was one of the largest design acquisitions that's been done to date. So um, about in a, a little under two years, we drove off the cliff and sold the company. Um, and I joined Hot Studio with um, many of my now former employees um, where I go to work as a director of uh, product design at Facebook. Those are the actions of a DEO, a design executive officer. It is a made up, it is a made up word. <laughs> Unless, of course, we're talking about God. God, design executive officer, I don't see the difference. Um, a DEO is a creative business leader, a person who is distinctly different from traditional business leaders. And they're uniquely qualified to solve the kind of complex problems we are facing today. So before we begin, we're, you know, we're at the end here, um, and uh, so far there's been no alcohol or nothing to warm us up, so we're gonna have to warm up a little bit so we can go and drink heavily. Um, who here defines themselves as creative? All right, about maybe half of you. I don't know what the other half of you have been doing. Um, who here defines themselves as a leader? Okay, another, like, a little less than 50%. And then who here is a risk taker? Really, truly risk taper, taker. I see some hands up. I see a lot of hands up. How much of a risk taker are you? You want to take a risk? Yes? Okay, so uh, everybody just stand up for now. Just stand up. Okay, so... Um, this is a great opportunity to meet new people. So if you've been like, you know, you don't need Tinder. There are a few women here. So we got to kind of, the women have to kind of, they have to kind of disperse around the crowd a little bit. But, you know, you know this is really about meeting somebody new. So if, you, if there's somebody that you, you know, really want to meet, this is a great opportunity to say hi to them. Um, so um, we're all going to take a risk. Um, we're going to, uh, we're going to do trust fall. Oh, just kidding. Should we do it? No. <laughs> okay, all right. I was thinking, yeah, we could all do a trust fall. But um, so for the first part of this, I just want you to honestly, and don't fake this, I want you to just turn to somebody that you have never met before and say hello, who, who, why you're here, who you're here. Just for a minute, just do it. It's like church. Just do it. <laughs> but, but don't take too long because I, we got time. We got to get through this. So, like in one minute, turn to somebody and say hello. Okay. Okay. Stop. Stop talking. <laughs> Stop talking. All right, there's more to this. There's more to this. Okay. All right. That was that was uh that was okay. I could t I'm Italian. I could talk much louder than you. Don't worry. Okay, so that was kind of a low risk, right? We're going to up the ante. I want you to go back to that person and I want you to give them a hug for 10 seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds. Don't wimp out. This is about taking risks. I'm going to count. Hug like you mean it. One, two, three. No, I'll keep hugging. You're not hugging. Keep hugging. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. All right. Okay. Sit down.
You can sit down. You can continue the hugging later. Believe me, this will, this will keep going. This will keep going. How did that feel? Did it feel creepy? Really? Did you like, did you get like a warm feeling? Did somebody do anything inappropriate? Okay, so congratulations. Oh my God, I did it. <laughs> oh no, I fucked up. <laughs> All right, good. All right. Um, you just took the first step as a DEL. The su success of all businesses lie in people and how we can make powerful, meaningful connections to one another. Doesn't matter how many awards we've won, what our job title says, and how many years we've been working in business. We are all peers here. And when people feel like they're treated as equals, that is when great things can happen. I think you've seen some themes throughout the day about that. I know PJ talked about collaboration a lot. Being an equal starts with you feeling like one as well. So the first thing you need to do as a leader is focus on being present. Look at people right in their eyes and listen. I often, like, do you ever go to a coffee shop and you um, buy coffee or whatever you're buying and you leave and you realize you've never actually looked up at the person that was serving you coffee? Remember to focus and meet people right where they are in life. So I, I want to share a little history with you. So this is a picture of me um, at five years old. And um, underneath that glistening silver fake Christmas tree that rotated to Silent Night, you can see that Santa bought me, um, can I do this cool thing? Yes, right there. An automatic spin art set. I loved that kit so much. Okay, good design or bad design? <laughs> How many people think it's good design? How many people think it's bad design? Maybe we should do an A-B test, one with bodies, one without bodies. I think this is like brilliant design. I just love the fact that their bodies are cut off here and all the levels of typography. It's very, very authentic to me. But as long as I could remember, I wanted to grow up to be a famous artist. It was never a question in my mind. It was my destiny. And um, my entrepreneurial life began at a very young age. My mother taught cooking classes. I grew up in Staten Island, and my mom um, taught cooking classes in the basement of my house. And on the wood paneled walls hung my paintings. I took painting classes when I was like eight years old onward. And um, her, her students became my first clients. So when I was about 15, I made a decent living as a dog portrait painter. <laughs> I get $25 a painter painting. And then when I was in high school, I moved up to jean jackets. I would paint the back of jean jackets and get $100 for a jean jacket while I was babysitting, essentially doubling my hourly rate. I didn't know it at the time, but I was a very smart businesswoman. And in 1987, I moved to the, accidentally moved to the Bay Area and eventually set out on my own as a freelance designer after working for uh, Richard Saul Werman. And I kept getting busier, so I just started hiring people to help. This is how most businesses begin, by the way. Um, and so before I knew it, I accidentally founded a company. And um, in 1997, my um, new boyfriend, new then boyfriend and now husband, named it Hot Studio. But that's a story I could tell you much later over drinks. So a more accurate title for me is designer CEO or DEO a person who puts the value of design at the center of the company. So a DEO or design executive officer is a combination of a strategic business executive and a creative problem solver. The DEO looks at all problems as design problems, solvable through the right mix of imagination and metrics. They don't follow traditional rules and they strive in a world of ambiguity and chaos. 
because they're catalysts for transformation and agents of change. And they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily trained designers. They come from all disciplines and all industries. They're business leaders and social innovators. They're um, government leaders and artists. Uh, but they all seem to share this, um, the way they work and live in this state of the state of juxtaposition of analytics, anthropology, and creativity. So why, why is this happening now? Um, why is this new opportunity for this new form of leadership? Well, first of all, um, one reason is that we are living and have lived in a, a time of exceptional volatility and change. We're, you know, this part of our life, we're seeing so much good and we're seeing so much bad at the same time. And in 1937, the biggest companies had an average life expectancy of 75 years. When you went into business and you started a company, you started it for life. But today, most companies, their lifespan is only about 15 years. When we think about the Amazons and we think about Google and we think about Facebook. Facebook is only 10 years old. My son is 11. My son's 14. My daughter's 11. <laughs> They're like still teenagers. My, voice is, my son's voice is changing. Facebook is 10, 10 years old. So life, the company's life expectancies are much, much shorter. And how many people can tell me what the average age of tenure is in companies these days? for millennials, not, not, not one month, <laughs> 18, 18 months to two years. That is a very short period of time. That creates a lot, a lot of volatility. My parents, my father, he worked for the phone company. Like the minute he got out of the Air, Air Force, out of the Korean War, till like him, him retiring. How many people have parents like that? Like jobs forever. And sadly, only one in four employees believe that their companies have the right leaders to succeed in the future. But there's great news. Businesses have flourished in companies in which design leaders are operating at the CEO or DEO level. According to designers funds, designer founders have had successful businesses that have been acquired for billions and billions of dollars. And before this like hysteria, this, what I'm calling this designer boom, we had this guy. I, this guy has, we haven't talked about him much these days, um, but I consider him in our generation, our fearless leader. And Steve turned the world upside down in our lifetime. How many of you, here's another dated question, how many of you can remember what life is like without that little computer in your pocket? You guys are fucking old. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So Steve is like this perfect combination of someone who's analytical by nature and yet deeply trusted his creative instinct to make some of the most innovative business decisions our generation has ever seen. And I'm going to, I feel I have to read this quote because every time I read it, to still to this day, it gives me goosebumps. And just the quote itself just it's inspires me to work harder. Um, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of roles. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Ah. <laughs> How many people got goosebumps? A few people. I mean, this is what we're all aspiring to. Like today, we, we had our minds blow by all of these details about how to create better experiences. But ultimately, our key objective in life is to change the world. A little, little reference to Christina Woodkey over there. So creative leaders like Steve Jobs, they possess special superpowers over traditional leaders that are both unique in nature and powerful in practice. And now you can do this too. 
They're change agents. They disrupt the status quo by thinking outside of the box versus the fear of ever leaving the box. They embrace risk versus mitigating, avoiding, or just running from risk. They connect the dots by seeing patterns and think in systems. They have the ability to solve complex problems versus solving problems just linearly one at a time. They're socially intelligent and people-centered. They have deep empathy for people by focusing on creating relevant and meaningful experiences versus being motivated by making money, moving metrics, or just closing deals. They're driven by curiosity, imagination, and intuition. And the passion fuels the work, but they are deeply, deeply committed to excellence and craft. And finally, they have this. What is this? Yes, yes. They get shit done. They know how to get shit done. They have an urgency and focus to get it done, but get it done right, get it done better, than anyone else. And it's in their DNA. And it's the type of qualities we need to solve these big problems we're facing today. So let's discuss how we can put these design superpowers into action. So these are tips and tools that I've used in just instinctively while um, growing my business over, over the last couple years. And I'm really happy to share them with you today. But really, I, remember, I went to art school. I got a BFA at Cooper Union. These, these came to me because of my design lens. And I want to share these with you today because I feel like they apply to everybody. And I also want to uh, talk about some people who, are, who embody these um, tips and tools as well. So the very first one is, um, is about Emily Pilliton. How many people know Emily Pilliton? Good. If you don't know her, you should, you should Google her and look her up. She's a DEO who knows that design can change the world. Um, she's an industrial designer, an architect, a builder, a world changer. And she began her career by forming a nonprofit called Project H, where it's basically uh, a service agency that served, um, that created design solutions in underserved communities. But a few years ago, she decided to really turn to support this new creativity-starved underserved community, middle school and high school students. Through this um, groundbreaking design build program, she teaches the power of design to people who are no longer being taught how to use these creative skills in school. Like Emily, the very first thing we need to do is change our mindset from design being thought of as an expense on a balance sheet, an artifact, to an investment in the future. Design is not a noun. Design is an active verb. And it means all these things. Co-create, participate, listen, facilitate, reinvent, communicate, instigate, innovate, negotiate, observe, partner, translate. Design, to design is to embrace change from producers of artifacts to champions of a connected society. Number two, value we, not me. In um, 2003, Chris Anderson purchased the TED conference from my old boss, Richard Saul Werman. And when Richard founded the conference and owned the conference, it really was this elitist event that you had to pay back then in the 80s, you know, thousands of dollars to attend. And it was this closed conference um, where the smartest people in the world got together and talked to other smart people. And um, it happened once a year. And if you were not there and you couldn't afford to be there, you're shit out of luck. So Chris Anderson purchased this, this elitist conference. And he turned it from a conference to an experience that can be shared by everyone around the world through the online TED Talks, which we don't pay for. Making this work re requires learning how to share power. This correlates very nicely to Mars' mention of that helper's high and, and that overwhelming power of we. We're no longer in this culture of me. 
no longer that lone rock star in the corner that doesn't recognize anybody and is just known, uh, just recognizes himself or herself for their individual contributions. Now, we live in a culture of we, where nothing can be created without collaboration, cooperation, and teamwork. The best ideas and solutions to problems come from multidisciplinary teams, where everyone feels like they've contributed to the design process. In this context, we are all designers. So make everyone part of the creative process. PJ talked about this with his uh, collaboration walls. Designers must give up this word, this, owning this word and keeping it all for themselves. Yes, there's craft. Yes, there's methodology. There's, there's a way to do great quality work. But we are all part of the design process. So, instead of having the designer, the engineer, the data scientist, treat your peers and coworkers as co-creators. And respect the fact that they each can bring something to the table based on their own area of expertise and view of the world. Make everyone feel like they're at the same level and that their opinion, that their opinion is important to you. What I like to say is more brains, more ideas, better solutions. And one way to embrace the power of we is to celebrate diversity. That can mean many different things. It can mean diversity of work and life experience. It could be um, diversity of discipline and area of focus. Uh, it could mean diversity of gender. It could also be diversity of point of view. There are lots of studies out there that support um, the idea that diverse teams are more efficient and innovative than non-diverse teams. And um, this music, this, uh, this picture, I put this up for my own amusement, frankly, this picture of cats, because my husband hates musicals. How many people hate musicals? And most of the men in the room probably hate musicals. <laughs> so there's this, there was a study in 2005 um, from Stanford that asked, what determines the success of a Broadway musical? I just find that really funny. But um, what the Stanford, learned, uh, the Stanford um, study learned was fascinating. First, the group needs to be diverse, including a balanced ratio of rookie performers to experienced performers. Secondly, the experienced performers need to be willing to embrace the new performers' ideas and break from the familiar. That's why cats can go on for 50 plus years. These two guidelines together create this culture of collaboration that feeds off of one another, much like jazz musicians improvising together. Number three. Live in People's Shoes. Kate Storr and Cameron Sinclair were co-founders of Architecture for Humanity. And collectively, they have changed hundreds of thousands, the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world by um, building structures to restore communities in need. And uh, it was a project we did uh, at, at, at Hot Studio where uh, we went down, we um, created this open architecture network. The on, it was a network that connected um, designers uh, and um, designers and architects around the world to collaborate on humanitarian-based projects. And we spent so many hours doing research. We interviewed people around the world by phone, asking them questions. We followed the process. But then it wasn't until Kate and Cameron said, why don't you come to Biloxi with us and spend a weekend? Which we did, and we slept on the floor of a church with hundreds of other volunteers in 100 degree weather. And that's when we really understood the tragedy that people went through, but also the amazing hope of people um, coming together uh, uh, to help others. So living, you can do this. You can live at people's, uh, in pe people's shoes at any scale. Inform your un intuition by understanding real life experiences. By living in people's shoes, your employees, your customers, your peers, and your community, you can look for innovation 
in the white spaces, not in focus groups in conference rooms with two-way mirrors. And as DEO, you need to care deeply for all people. It starts here first. And through your own work, you can help improve people's lives too. Number four, champion creative culture. Did you, does anybody know what the average n number of hours you work in your lifetime is? It's kind of depressing. Anybody know? Get, just take a num guess. How many hours you work in your lifetime? 30,000. 30, Anybody else? How much? 130. Yeah, somewhere in between. 90,000 hours at work in your lifetime. So you better enjoy coming to work every day. Recent research on companies point to one common denominator. Creating the right culture is key to success. And it can start with you right at your desk. Create an environment that encourages and rewards creativity in others. Creativity and innovation needs to be baked into the culture from the top down and the bottom up. We, don't forget, we were all born creative. It just gets beaten out of us at a young age. And in order to get the best ideas out of teams, don't forget to make it fun to come to work every day. <coughs> Parents are dialed into this fact. Kids model behavior and so do coworkers. Come to work with a positive attitude every day. This can't be too hard, right? Everybody wants to do a good job, but it's usually the leaders who get in the way. Be aware of the controls that are barriers to effectiveness and overall happiness and increased stress. Bad bosses could increase the risk of stroke by 33%. Yeah. So on a positive note, <laughs> nine out of 10 people say that, that they're more productive when they're around positive people. And increasing positive emotions could actually lengthen your lifespan by 10 years. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the job that you're in. You're thinking about the stress you're under. Think that life is short, you got 90,000 hours, and be careful where you work. And make sure that you are respecting people and being um, positive, because otherwise you're gonna kill them. <laughs> 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 so, create, um, create um, creative chaos. If you've ever been told your desk is too messy, this is your moment to shine. <laughs> A report just published found that a cluttered workspace could actually enhance problem-solving skills and boost efficiency. Yes! So good ideas are messy and promote creative chaos. PJ mentioned in his talk, right on the walls and the tables and the windows. And uh, you don't have writable services? These incredible giant post-it notes work wonders. Just bring them to meetings. Something magical happens when you stop talking and you start taking notes. People actually think and understand, they see that you're listening to them. And I always like to go topless at meetings. How about you? <laughs> How many people go topless? Okay, a lot of women are going topless, yes. Some men are going topless too. So go lap topless and take notes publicly. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> um, and, to, and ask people to put away their phones and focus. It helps you listen more attentively, and your team collaborators will feel appreciated, respected, and they, see, they can see that they've been heard. And PJ also talked about this, like communication is hard. So what happens when you have a disagreement with a stakeholder or a coworker? What I like to tell people is to work it out over lunch. I'm, I'm Italian. We, we solve all arguments over the dinner table. <coughs> If you're new to town, sit at a communal table or, or on a bar stool, or make it a goal to introduce yourself to someone new, or maybe give them a hug um, or two. And another bit of good news is for the drinkers amongst us, studies show that alcohol in moderation can enhance creativity. You like where this is going, folks? <laughs> okay. So Christina talked about celebrating wins with beer on Friday. At Facebook, we have these pop-up bars everywhere. Um, so I'm just saying, keep your refrigerator well stocked. Finally, five, iterate and evolve. 
Facebook is a place that celebrates moving fast and being bold. There are posters taped to the walls everywhere. And here's my favorite one. This journey is 1% finished. In order to build an innovative culture, you have to keep the company in a constant state of iteration and reinvention. Show progress and move forward. And it's long been said that travel broadens the mind. Now new evidence proves that jumping on a plane will actually make you smarter. And it does some other things as a designer. It gives you valuable open-mindedness. And it also makes you see that one simple thing you do can have multiple meanings. So travel more or just get out of the office. Sit in a park, take a long walk, clear your mind, and open yourself up to new possibilities. We've heard this a lot today, feedback. This is an exercise that I would do when I was a CEO at Hot Studio. I would, once a year, I would conduct a listening tour and hear from every single person in the company. So Hot Studio was 100 people, so it was no small feat. And we would organize discussions around key themes. And under each theme, we would, we would call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good is to celebrate those wins. The bad is that, you know, really, it's not good. We got, it's gotta go, it's got, we gotta fix it. And the ugly is don't ever fucking do it again. And um, it's important when you're a leader to stay humble and solicit feedback continuously. It's really good to ask people, how am I doing? And what do you think I could do better? It takes personal courage and vulnerability to throw out wild ideas. So be empowered to be wrong. Embrace failure as a way of learning. And be empowered to change your mind. Early failures could lead to course correction, new discoveries, and new directions. And DEOs like Mark Zuckerberg understand that vision without execution is hallucination. They know that they'll ultimately be judged by what they do, not what they dream. So ideas are only good if you could bring them to life. So have the courage to take smart risks every day and just get the shit done. Try to find that balance between iteration and deliberation, between data that informs your thought process and using pure gut intuition. Remember. Innovation has no chance of succeeding until it leaves the building. So in order to solve the world's problems, we need to think like designers, feel like designers, and work like designers. And here is the great news. There is a designer in every single one of you. So open your eyes wide, be courageous, and touch people's hearts and minds. Help us work together as a team, this party of equals, to solve the world's most complex problems. Help us build a better future for our children. We could do this as designers, as creative business leaders, as DEOs. So, be your authentic you. <laughs> Don't be afraid to show who you really are. And have the courage to think differently and have the confidence to be different. If this girl with the funny accent and the big hair can sell her company to Facebook, I think you can too. So begin right now. You be the champion or you find an advocate. And these skills, they could all be learned over time. So take baby steps, but start right now and be committed to change. Bring out your inner DEO and help build this next generation of creative leaders. To end, I'd like to quote the, the great DEO Lady Gaga. You are all born superstars. Go and find your own stage. So thank you for your time today. Find somebody new at the bar and hug them. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>